Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Ray Milland, Dorothy McGuire, and Brian Ahern in The Winslow Boy. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When The Winslow Boy opened on Broadway, playwright Terence Rattigan was acclaimed not only for creating a heartwarming drama, but because he immortalized the right of the individual. In this case, the individual is a small boy, defended against the charge of theft by all the resources of three people who believed in him his father, his sister, and his lawyer. And to play the roles in this important trio, we are presenting three stars who have long been noted for their histrionic ability. Ray Milan, Dorothy McGuire, and Brian Ahern. But now before our play gets underway, here's an important message from Ken Carpenter. Here's one thing that's for sure. Even though fashions change, the gals will go right on loving and wearing sheer beautiful nylons. And I'm just as confident that they'll go right on giving those nylons gentle Lux Flakes care, as always. Ninety-six percent of stocking manufacturers come right out and recommend Lux Flakes. The men who make nylons know, and women know, gentle Lux Flakes care really can double the life of every single pair. Oh, it, it's a sad fact that the same gals who wear beautiful stockings spend time every day doing dishes. But a new Lux product. New Lux Liquid Detergent helps out here. This new member of the Lux family was invented to do dishes fast and easy. Its formula literally soaks grease off plates. Dishes actually soak clean in Lux Liquid. So you just rinse and stack, that's all. No wonder people are saying Lux Liquid is the next best thing to a dishwashing machine. Now Lux Liquid cuts work way down and it's economical. One can will outlast several boxes of the leading laundry powder. It's uniquely packed in a can that won't break with a spout that won't drip. And it's mild, Lux mild on your hands. Behind both Lux Flakes and Lux Liquid is the Lever Brothers' money-back guarantee. Your money will be refunded if both these products don't live up to everything we say about them. Now, Act One of The Winslow Boy. England, 1912. For several months now, an obscure gentleman named Arthur Winslow, a retired banker, has been waging war with the British Empire. A war involving justice, his little boy, and the absurd sum of five shillings. This morning, Mr. Winslow has a caller, another in the endless parade of reporters who have made the name of little Ronnie Winslow famous throughout England. Mr. Winslow, you're surprised to see a lady reporter? Oh, I know, everyone is, but the editor sends me out on stories with special appeal to women, like this one, a father's fight for his little son's honor. No, oh, I uh, believe this case has uh, wider implications, Miss Barnes. Oh, yes, the political angle. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, now then, you do have other children, do you not? Uh, Ronnie is the youngest. My other son, Richard, has been attending Oxford. And Catherine, my daughter, is the oldest. Catherine Winslow... Oh, why, yes, she works quite actively for the Women's Suffrage Association. Oh, she does indeed. And she has also been a tower of strength in my efforts to bring this dastardly case to trial. Yes, yes, I see. Uh, now, what I'd really like to do is get a nice photograph of you and your little boy together. I have my camera, but where is our little hero? He's arriving from school. His mother's at the station to meet him. From school? You've got another school to take him? Huh? I mean, they didn't mind all the unpleasantness. Well... Why is he coming back this time? Oh, hasn't been expelled again, if that's what you mean. He's coming home to be interviewed by Sir Robert Morton. We hope he'll agree to take the case. Sir Robert Morton? A little case like this? My dear madam, if you ever read newspapers, uh, including the one that you represent, you'd be aware by now that this is not a little case. No, no, of course not, but uh, still, Sir Robert Morton. Well, I understand he's the best lawyer in England. He's certainly the most expensive. Well, now, if you won't mind giving me a few de of the details... When did it all start? Nine long months ago. First I knew of the charge was when my son arrived home with a letter informing me of his expulsion for stealing a five-shilling postal order. I telephoned Osborne at once and was referred to the Lords of the Admiralty. 
Well, my lawyer, Mr. Desmond Curry, requested the fullest possible inquiry. For weeks, we were ignored. And then met with a blank refusal and only finally granted reluctant permission to review the evidence. Really? We decided that the so-called evidence fully justified a reopening of the proceedings. We applied to the Admiralty for a court-martial. They ignored us. We applied for a civil trial. Again, we were ignored. But after tremendous pressure had been brought to bear, letters to the newspapers, questions in the House of Commons, and other means open to private citizens of this country, the Admiralty agreed to what they called an independent inquiry. Oh, good. It was not good, madam. At that independent inquiry, conducted by the judge advocate of the fleet, my son, a child of 13 was not represented by counsel, solicitors, or friends. Now, what do you think of that? And what happened? Oh, inevitably, he was found guilty again. Branded for the second time as a thief and a forger. What a shame. I have fought this monstrous injustice with every weapon and every means at my disposal. I shall continue to fight. Oh, what charming window curtains. Uh, I beg your pardon? Your window curtains, they're perfectly delicious. What are they made of? Madam, I, uh, I fear I have no idea. Father, father, where are you? Oh, do I have a poor little chap ticket himself? Sitting on your Hello, couch. Father. Oh, 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 I mean, tow your couch. I see, the father. Gas Mr. Moore says I'm to tell you I needn't come back till Monday. Three whole days. Yeah, mind my leg. Oh, sorry, father. Arthritis again. Sure, so the doctor repeatedly tells me at one guinea per visit. Oh, well, how are you? Absolutely top hole, father. Ah, now that's exactly the way I'd like to take my picture. Would you hold it, Mr. Winslow, please? And uh, Sonny? Who is she? Now a bit of a smile, Mr. Winslow. A sad smile, if you don't mind. There we are. Oh. Oh, uh, Grace, dear, this is uh, Miss Barnes from the Daily News. Uh, she's extremely pleased with your window curtains. Oh, how nice. I would so much like to know what they're made of. Well, it's an entirely new material, you know. I'm afraid I don't know what it's Father, called. Father, are we going to be in the Daily News? <laughs> it appears so. Oh, good. They get the Daily News in the school library, and everyone's bound to see it. Well, goodbye, Mr. Winslow. Goodbye, little chap. Goodbye, ma'am. And remember, the darkest hour is just before the dawn. Well, it was very good of you to tell me all that, Mrs. Winslow. I'm sure our readers will be most interested. Father, do you know that the train had 14 coaches? Did it indeed? I walked all the way down from one end to the other. Remarkable. And now run upstairs like a good boy and get washed. So Robert will be here in a few minutes. Oh, Kate. Kate, I'm back. Hello, darling. My, how you've grown. Oh, you can come in, Kate. Miss Barnes is gone. Thank heavens. Arthur, why, I thought she was charming. Well, dear, I must say that old dress has come out very well. John will never know it isn't brand new. John is late, curse him. Uh, Grace, um, go on up and attend to Ronnie, will you, dear? Oh, and, uh, and prepare that witch's brew the doctor left for me. I'll come up when you're ready. Oh, but you look lovely, Kate. Mm. Simply lovely. Oh, Kate. <sighs> Are we both mad, you and I? Oh, what's the matter, dear? I don't know. I feel suddenly suicidally inclined. A father's fight for his little boy's honor. Special appeal to all women. Photo insert of Mrs. Winslow's curtains. So we just drop the whole thing. Well, I don't consider that a serious question. You realize that if we go on your marriage settlement, the money I've been saving for you, it must go. Oh, I gave that up for last weeks ago. Things, uh... Things are all right between you and John, aren't they? Oh, but of course, darling. Uh, I mean, it uh, wouldn't make any difference between you two, will it? Oh, good heavens, no. Oh, very well, then. Let's pin our faith on Sir Robert Morton. You know what I think of Sir Robert Morton, Father. Kate, I want the best. The best in this case certainly isn't Morton. Then why does everyone say he is? Because if one happens to be a, a large monopoly attacking a trade union or a Tory newspaper libeling a labor leader, then he is the best. But it utterly defeats me how you or anyone else could expect a man of his record to have even a tenth of his heart in a case where the shoe is entirely on the other foot. Oh, I imagine if his heart isn't in it, he won't accept. Oh, he might. It depends what there is in it for him. Luckily, there isn't much. There's a fairly substantial check. Oh, he doesn't need money. Well, what does he want, then? Anything that advances his interests. <laughs> You're prejudiced because he spoke against women's suffrage. Is that it? Yes. And because he's always speaking about against what is right and just. Arthur? Arthur, dear? Uh, coming, coming. You're my only ally, Kate. Without you, I should have given up long ago. Oh, rubbish. But I, I do have an instinct about Morton. Yes, Father. Oh, well, we'll see which is right. My instinct or your reason, huh? I'm afraid we will. Hello, Kate. What's the matter, Dickie? Haven't you heard? Hmm. 
Father says I'm through at Oxford at the end of the year. Oh, Dickie, I'm awfully sorry. Did you know it was in the wind? Well, I knew there was a risk. There are many things Father can't afford anymore. I could just about murder that little Ronnie. Well, what do you have to go about pinching postal orders for? And what's worse, why does he have to get himself nabbed doing it? That's enough, Dickie. Silly little blighter. A five-shilling postal order and my college career is ended. Oh, well. It'll all work out, I suppose. The old man says they'll find me a job in the bank. It's all right, Violet. I'll answer it. John? It better be. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was expecting a friend. Good evening. My name is Morton. My name is Winslow. Won't you come in? My father will be down in a moment. Thank you. I have a dinner engagement. My time is rather limited. Oh, I see. Is there anything I can get for you? A whiskey and soda, brandy? No, thank you. Will you smoke? No, thank you. I hope you don't mind if I do. Why should I? Well, some people find it shocking. A lady in her own home is surely entitled to behave as she wishes. You're looking at your watch. May I ask what time you're dining? Eight o'clock. Far from here? Devonshire House. Oh, then of course you mustn't on any account be late. No. I suppose you know the history of this case, Sir Robert. I've seen most of the relevant documents. Do you think we can bring the case into court on a collusive action? I really have no idea. Desmond Curry seems to think that might hold. Does he? Desmond Curry is a very reliable man. I'm rather surprised that a case of this sort should interest you at all. Are you? It seems such a very trivial affair compared to most of your great triumphs. I was in court during your cross-examination of Len Rogers in the trades union embezzlement case. Really? It was masterly. Thank you. I suppose you heard that he committed suicide a few months ago. Yes, I had heard. Many people believed him innocent, you know. As it happens, however, he was guilty. Oh, so Robert, I'm Arthur Winslow. Oh, how do you do? He's dining at Devonshire House, Father. He's rather pressed for time. Oh, my, uh, my son will be down directly. I, I expect you'll want to question him. But I fear I'll have time for only a few questions. Oh, rather sorry to hear that. I was hoping uh, to know definitely if you'd accept this case or not. Perhaps Sir Robert will consent to finish his examination some other time. It might be arranged sometime next week. Uh, Desmond Curry has been telling me that, uh, that you think it might be possible to proceed by petition of right. Well, granting the assumption that the Admiralty, like the Crown, can do no wrong. But I, I thought that was exactly the assumption we refused to grant three months ago. The subject can sue the Crown by petition of right, Miss Winslow. Redress being granted as a matter of grace. It is the custom of the Attorney General on behalf of the Crown to endorse the petition and allow the case to come to trial. It is interesting to note that the exact words used on such occasions are, let right be done. Let right be done. Yes. Father. Oh, uh, uh, this is my son. Uh, Ronnie, this is Sir Robert Morton. Well, how do you do, I'm sir? I'm going to ask you a few questions. You must answer them truthfully. Uh, as, uh, as you always have... Uh, I expect you'd like us to leave. No, provided that you don't interrupt. Miss Winslow, will you please sit down? Hmm? What? Oh. Now, tell me, Master Winslow, exactly what happened. Well, it was last year, sir, the 7th of July. And just before lunch, I went to see the chief petty officer and asked him to let me have 15 and 6 out of what I had in the college bank. Why? I wanted to buy an air pistol. And how much money did you have in the college bank? Two pounds, three shillings. Oh, sir, you see, sir, what possible incentive could there be to steal five I shillings? I must ask you not to interrupt. After you'd withdrawn the 15 and 6, what did you do? I had lunch. Then what? I went to the locker room to put the 15 and 6 in my locker. And then? I went to get permission to go down to the post office. Then I went back to the locker room, got out my money, and went down to the post office. Well? I bought my postal order. For 15 and 6? Yes. Then I went back to college. Then I met Charlie Elliott, and he said, I say, isn't it rot? Someone's broken into my locker and pinched a postal order. I've reported it to the P.O. Those were Charlie Elliott's exact words. He might have used another word for rot. Continue. Well, then, just before class, I was told to see the commander. The woman from the post office was there, and the commander said, Is this the boy? And she said, it might be. I can't be sure. They all look so much alike. But you see, she couldn't identify. Mr. Winslow, please. Go on. Then she said, I only know that the boy who bought a postal order for 15 and 6 was the same boy that cashed one for 5 shillings. So the commander said, Did you buy a postal order for 15 and 6? And I said, Yes. Then they made me write Charles' name on an envelope and compared it to the signature on the postal order. Then they sent me to the sanatorium. And 10 days later, I was sacked. I mean, expelled. I see. 
Well, when the commander asked you to write Elliot's name in an envelope, what did you write? I wrote Charles K. Elliot. Why? Because that was the way that Charlie usually signed his name. How did you know? Well, he, he was a friend of mine. That's no answer. How did you know? I'd seen him sign things. What things? Ordinary things. What things? Bits of paper. Bits of paper? Why did he sign his name on bits of paper? I don't know. You do know. Why did he sign his name on bits of paper? He was practicing his signature. And you saw him? Yes. Did he know you saw him? Well, oh, yes. In other words, he showed you exactly how he wrote his signature. Yes, I, I suppose he did. Did you practice writing it yourself? I might have. Just tell me if you did or if you did not. Yes. Raleigh. You never told me that. It was only for a joke, Father. Joke or not, the fact is you practiced forging Elliot's signature. It wasn't forging. Oh, and what would you call it? Well, writing. Very well, writing. Whoever stole the postal order and cashed it also wrote Elliot's signature, didn't he? Yes. And oddly enough, in the exact form in which you had earlier been practicing writing his signature. I say, which side are you on? Don't be impertinent. Are you aware that the Admiralty sent up the forged postal order to Mr. Ridgely Pierce, the greatest handwriting expert in England? Yes, sir. And you still say you didn't forge that signature? Yes, I do. In other words, Mr. Ridgely Pierce doesn't know his job. Well, he's wrong anyway. Really, Sir Robert? Be quiet, please. I won't be quiet. I have a... When you went into the locker room after lunch, were you alone? I don't remember. I think you do. Were you alone in the locker room? Yes. What did you do after leaving the locker room? I told you. I went for permission to go to the post office. What time was that? About a quarter past two. Which means that you were alone in the locker room for half an hour. I, I wasn't there all that time. How long were you there? About, about five minutes. What were you doing for the other 25? I don't remember. How odd your memory is so good about some things and so bad about others. Perhaps I waited outside the CO's office. And perhaps no one saw you there either. No, I don't think they did. What were you thinking about outside the CO's office for 25 minutes? I don't even know if I was there. I can't remember. Perhaps I wasn't there at all. No? Perhaps you were still in the locker room, rifling Elliot's locker. So, Robert, I, I must ask Please you... be quiet. I remember now. I remember. Someone did see me outside the CO's office. A chap called Casey. I remember I spoke to him. What did you say? I said, come down to the post office with me. I'm going to cash a postal order. Cash a postal order? I mean, get. You said cash. Why did you say cash if you meant get? I don't know. I suggest cash was the truth. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't really. You're muddling me. You seem very easily muddled. How many other lies have you told? None, really, I haven't. I suggest your whole testimony is a lie. No, it's the truth. I suggest there is barely one single word of truth in anything you've said either to me or to the judge advocate or to the commander. I suggest that you broke into Elliot's locker, that you stole the postal order for five shillings and cashed it by means of forging his name. I didn't, I didn't. I suggest that you did it for a joke, <laughs> meaning to give Elliot the five shillings back. But that when you met him and he said he'd reported the matter, that you got frightened and decided to keep quiet. No, no, it isn't true. I suggest that by continuing to deny your guilt, you are causing great hardships to your own family and considerable annoyance to high and important persons in this country. That's a disgraceful thing to say. Oh, I, I suggest that the time has come at last for you to undo some of the misery that you've caused by confessing to us all now that you are a forger, a liar, and a thief. I'm not. I'm not. I didn't do it. Well, this is outrageous. Is it? The boy is plainly innocent. I accept the case and will do my utmost to bring it to trial. Good evening. Act two of The Winslow Boy, starring Ray Milland as Sir Robert Morton, Dorothy McGuire as Kate, and Brian Ahern as Mr. Winslow. Seven weary months have passed since Sir Robert Morton agreed to defend Master Ronnie Winslow against the government of England. And from Piccadilly Circus to Hong Kong, wherever there are Englishmen, the case is argued endlessly. The theft of the five shillings doesn't seem to matter. What matters tremendously is whether or not this little boy has the right to sue the British Empire in a court of law. It's evening now, and Mr. Winslow is reading aloud from the newspaper. Concluding with still another attack upon the Admiralty, whereupon the Right Honorable First Lord leapt to his feet and... Ronnie, I trust my reading isn't keeping you awake. Good heavens, Grace, the boy's asleep. Poor little lamb, it's way past his bedtime. Huh? 
This very moment, your poor little lamb is responsible for considerable disturbance in the House of Commons. Ronnie, wake up. Uh, oh, uh, yes, Father? I'm reading the account of the debate. Well, I'm listening, Father. I like to listen with my eyes closed. Uh, very well. Now then, the House obviously was moved by Sir Robert Morton's resonant use of the words, let right be done. Nevertheless, it is argued that Cadet Ronald Winslow was a servant of the Crown and therefore has no more right than any other member of His Majesty's forces to sue the Crown in open court. To allow him to do so would... Oh, he's asleep again. I'd better take him upstairs. He'll be so much more comfy in his little bed. I dare say, but the debate in the House of Commons continues, and until it's ended, the cause of it all certainly will not make himself comfy in his little bed. Excuse me. Huh? Yeah, yes, Father. Three more reporters at the door, sir. Shall I let them in? No, certainly not. Yes, sir. Uh, Grace, Grace, dear, might this not be a, a good opportunity to talk to Violet? No, it would not. But it be, Grace, putting it off only adds to your worries. It's easy for you to talk, Arthur. You don't have to do it. Well, I will if you like. No, thank you. We'll give her excellent references. I won't have it. It's nothing short of brutal to send her packing after all these years. The facts are brutal things. Oh, I don't think I know what facts are anymore. The facts at this moment are that we have one half of the income we had a year ago, and we're living at almost the same rate. However you look at it, that's bad economics. I'm not talking economics. I'm talking about Violet. I'm also talking about the happy home we once had and a future for us and the children. Oh, I wish I could see the sense of it all. There's Ronnie, perfectly happy. He's at a good school and doing very well. No one need ever have known about Osborne if you hadn't gone and shouted it out to the whole world. As it is, whatever happens, he'll go through the rest of his life as the boy in the Winslow case. The boy who stole that postal order. The boy who didn't steal the postal order? You talk about sacrificing everything for him. But when he's grown up, he won't thank you for it, Arthur. Even though you've given your life to publish his innocence, as you call it. Oh, Grace, really? Yes, Arthur, your life. You're destroying yourself. And for what, I'd like to know? For what? For justice. Justice. Or is it just plain pride and sheer stubbornness? No, I don't think it is. I, I really don't think it is. Arthur... I can stand anything if there's a reason for it. But for no reason at all, it, it's unfair to ask so much of me. It's unfair. What's the matter, Father? Well, your, your mother's a little upset. Well, aren't things going well? Oh, yes, Ronnie. Very well. Very well indeed. <sighs> By Jove, how does he do it? <laughs> Sandwiches, sir, for Miss Casey. Huh? Oh, well, thank you, Violet. She's just... Home, she says she'll be right in, sir. Violet, what do you think of this case? No, it's a fine old rumpus, no mistake. Yes, it is, isn't it? A fine old rumpus. And when you think it's all because of our master, Ronnie, I have to laugh about it sometimes. I rarely do. Wasting the government's time at his age. Well, would that be all, sir? Uh, yes, yes, Violet, that'll be all. Hello, Father. <laughs> all alone? Mm, Ronnie, but he's sound asleep. Oh. Look at him. An honorable member described him not an hour ago as a piteous little figure crying aloud to humanity for justice and redress. I wish you could see him now. Uh, Kate, Kate, what happened? Is the debate over? As good as. What about it? Are they going to allow us a fair trial? Apparently not. That's iniquitous. Well, then we're, we're back where we started, then. It looks like it, dear. The debate's done us no good at all. But, uh, but didn't Sir Robert make any protest? Not a verbal protest. Something far more spectacular. He'd had his feet on the treasury table and his hat over his eyes and suddenly got up, glared at the First Lord, threw a great bundle of notes on the floor and stalked out of the house. <gasps> oh, it made a magnificent effect. If I hadn't known, I could have sworn he was actually indignant. Oh, of course he was indignant. So would any man of feeling be? Sir Robert is not a man of feeling. I don't think any emotion at all can stir that fishy heart. Except perhaps a love of justice. Oh, nonsense. A love of Sir Robert Morton. The man is a fish. A hard, cold-blooded, sneering fish. Sir Robert Morton. <gasps> Yuki. Good evening. Uh, good evening. I thought I'd call and let you know what's happened, but I see your daughter has forestalled me. Oh, you knew I was in the gallery? In such a charming hat, how could I have missed you? Oh, oh. Very good of you to call. Do I detect a small snore coming from the couch? Oh, Master Ronnie. Go, oh, Kate, uh, wake him up. No, 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 please. Besides, I'm sure that since our first encounter, he is uh, rather understandably a trifle nervous of me. Tell me something, Sir Robert. 
What happened in that first interview to make you so sure of his innocence? Well, first of all, he made far too many damaging admissions. A guilty person would have been much more on guard. Secondly, I set a trap for him, and thirdly, I left him a loophole. Anyone who was guilty would have fallen into the one and darted through the other. Master Ronald did neither. The trap was to ask him suddenly what time Elliot put the postal order in his locker. Am I right? Yes. And the loophole? My suggestion that he'd stolen the postal order as a joke. Had he been guilty, he'd have leapt on that as the lesser of the two evils. You're very clever. Thank you. Now, my daughter just told me of your demonstration during the First Lord's speech. She described it as magnificent. Did she? Well, it's a very old trick, you know, and nearly always surprisingly effective. Was the First Lord at all put out by it, did you notice? Oh, how could he have failed to be? Oh, I wish you could have seen it. Father, when did this come? When did what? Oh, oh, that letter. Some time ago. Do you know the writing? Yes, it's from John's father. I, uh, shouldn't oh. bother to read it if I were you. Oh, oh, but I must. It, uh, it came by special messenger. Uh, forgive me, Sir Robert, if I read it now. Well, what do you think the next step should be, Sir Robert? The renewal of our efforts to get the Director of Public Prosecutions to act. You think there's any chance of that? Oh, yes. Since it's mostly a matter of making ourselves a confounded nuisance. <laughs> We've certainly done that quite successfully so far, thanks to you. That is perhaps the only quality I was born with. The ability to annoy. Father, Sir Robert thinks we might get the director of public prosecutions to act. Huh? Oh, excuse me, I thought you'd finished your letter. We were discussing how to proceed with the case. The case? Forget the case. All things considered, very little purpose would be served by going on. Kate, uh, here. Of course, this... we must go on. The choice is mine, sir, not yours. To give up now would be insane. My sanity already has been questioned tonight for going as far as I have. Whatever is in that letter or whatever else has happened to make you lose heart, I insist that we continue. Insist? We? It is for me alone to judge when the time has come to give up. In heaven's name, I why? I have made many sacrifices for this case. Some of them I had no right to make. But there is a limit and I've reached it. I, I, I'm sorry, Sir Robert, but the Winslow case is closed. Bold of that. My father doesn't mean that, Sir Robert. I'm glad to hear it. This letter, let me explain it. Oh, Kate, no. Sir Robert, this letter is from the father of the man I'm engaged to. We've always known he was opposed to the case, so it comes as no surprise. He says that unless my father promises to drop this whining and reckless agitation, that he'll exert every influence to prevent John's marrying me. I see. An ultimatum. Yes. But a pointless one. He has no influence over his son? Oh, yes. But John's of age and his own master. Well, Mr. Winslow, your daughter seems prepared to take the risk. Oh, but I am not. At least until I know how great a risk it is. How do you estimate the risk, Miss Winslow? Negligible. I see. Mr. Winslow, I must apologize for speaking to you as I did just now. Oh, you were upset for giving up the case. And uh, to be frank, I liked you for it. Of course, you must decide as you wish. That is really a most charming hat, Miss Winslow. Oh, well, I, I'm glad you liked it. It seems decidedly wrong to me that a lady of your political persuasion should be allowed to adorn herself with such a very feminine allurement. It really looks so awfully like trying to have the best of both worlds. I'm not a militant, Sir Robert. I don't go about breaking shop windows with a hammer or, or pouring acid down letterboxes. I'm truly glad to hear that. Both those activities would be highly unsuitable in that hat. <laughs> Tell me, what active steps do you take to propagate your cause? I'm an organizing secretary at the West London branch of the Women's Suffrage Association. Indeed. Is the work hard? Very. And not, I should imagine, particularly lucrative. And starting in January, I shall be paid two months, two pounds a week. Dear me. What sacrifices you young ladies seem prepared to make for your conviction? Excuse me. It's your intended. He says, could he please have a word with you in private, miss? John? Tell him... Tell him I'll be right there, Violet. Kate, I... I have no right calling at this hour unexpectedly, but I have to see you. My father's written a letter to your father. I know, I've read it. Oh, well, what's his answer? My father, I don't suppose he'll send one. You think he'll ignore it? Isn't that the best answer to blackmail? Well, it was terribly high-handed of the old man, I'll admit. But, darling, this is going to take the most tactful sort of handling. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves in the soup. I mean, that's it all. I can't even live on my army pay as it is. But with two of us... Then tell me, dear. What do you suggest? 
Well, this is the way I see it. Your young brother pinches, or he doesn't pinch a five bob first, Lord. And for over a year, you and your father fight a magnificent fight on his behalf, and I'm sure that everyone admires you for it. Including your father. Go on, dear. Well, now, you've had two inquiries, the petition of right case with the Admiralty of Stone out of court, and the appeal. And now, amazingly enough, you've the whole House of Commons in a frenzy about it. Well, now, darling, surely that's enough. Surely the case can end there, hmm? Yes. I suppose it can. Bonnie won't mind. No, I know he won't. What's more, I'm not so sure he didn't steal the money in the first place. Good Lord. But then why in heaven's name of you and your father spent all this time and money trying to prove his innocence? His innocence and guilt aren't important to me. They are to my father, not to me. I don't believe he did it, but I may be wrong. All that I care about is that people should know that a government department has ignored a fundamental human right to a fair trial and that it should be forced to acknowledge it. That's all that's important to me, John. But it is terribly important. Well, darling, look. There's a European war blowing up. There's a cold strike on, and there's a fair chance of civil war in Ireland. And yet, with all that on its mind, the House of Commons takes a whole day to discuss Ronnie Winslow and his valley postal order. Well, now, surely that's a little out of proportion. All I know, John, is that if ever the time comes when the House of Commons can't find time to discuss a Ronnie Winslow and his valley postal order, this country will be a far poorer place than it is now. But you needn't go on, dear. I entirely see your point of view. Well, then, darling. You want to marry me, John? Well, of course I do. Oh, you know I do. I, I, I'm only telling you what I think is best for us. Even if we gave up the case, you'd still want to marry the Winslow girl? All that would blow over in no time. And we'd have the allowance from your father? Yes. And that's so important. Well, it is, darling. I'm sorry, but you can't shame me into saying that it isn't. I didn't mean to shame you, John. Well, now. What's the answer? I love you, John. I want to be your wife. Well, then, that's all I want to know. Ah, oh, darling, I was sure nothing so stupid and trivial could possibly come between us. Excuse me. Hello? Yes, Desmond. Will you wait a moment, please? Sir Robert, Desmond Curry wants to talk to you on the telephone. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. You didn't. we have finished our talk. Hello? Yes. Oh, I didn't know he was going to speak. I see. Go on. Thank you. There has been a most interesting development in the house. Well? Desmond Curry tells me the barrister friend of mine has just delivered one of the most scathing denunciations of the government department ever heard in the house. What a shame we missed it, Miss Winslow. His style is quite superb. Well? The debate revived, of course, and the First Lord suddenly found himself under attack from all parts of the house. It appears that rather than risk a party split, he has instructed the Attorney General to endorse our petition of right. The case of Winslow versus Rex can now therefore come to court. Well, sir, what are your instructions? The decision is no longer mine. You must ask my daughter. Miss Winslow? Uh, forgive me, Sir Robert, but I believe that I can give you Miss Winslow's decision. John, please. You need my decision, Sir Robert. Are the instructions already on the petition? Doesn't it say, let right be done? Okay, well then, we must endeavor to see that it is. Rises on Act Three of The Winslow Boys, starring Ray Milland as Sir Robert Morton, Dorothy McGuire as Kate, and Brian Ahern as Mr. Winslow. <laughs> At long last, the Winslow case has come to trial. And what is even more remarkable, a verdict actually is in the office. At home, Arthur Winslow waits impatiently for Kate to return from the courtroom. She's late, Grace. Yesterday she was home by half past one. You'll be along. Meanwhile, your lunch is ready, dear. I did it myself. Where's Violet? At the trial, of course. Oh, this is incredible. 
Every member of the household attends the trial except the one person who has the greatest cause for being there. But you know what the doctor said. It's fantastic. I must sit at home in a wheelchair while two years of struggle, hope, and abuse hang in the balance. Oh, we had a letter this morning from Vicky. Vicky? How is he? Splendid, dear, and getting on so well. He says he took Mr. Lamb, the manager, to the races on Saturday. The bank manager? Mm-hmm. Vicky said Mr. Lamb had the time of his life and... And lost his shirt. Did he? <laughs> oh, no doubt that given the chance, our Dickie will convert the entire Reading branch into a bookmaking establishment. Catherine, is that you? Oh, those reporters. Don't they ever go away? Did you bring Ronnie with you, dear? He's having lunch with Desmond Curry. You are to meet him in the corridor, Mother. Poor little pet. He did so well in the witness box yesterday. I guess he was there this morning. John. John? Hmm. Well, I hope you didn't speak to oh, him. But of course I did. Kate, how could you? What did he say? He was just luck. Oh, what impertinence. The idea of his coming there after the way he's treated you. Oh, no, great. Uh, you'll be late for the afternoon session. Oh, you? well, uh, I'm off then, dear. Now, don't let your father leave that wheelchair, oh. darling. Well, well, how did it go? I'm... I'm not sure, father. Oh, but I could cheerfully strangle that old brute of a judge. He's dead set against us. Does uh, Sir Robert share that opinion? Who knows? He's worried. That much I do know. I must admit, the Attorney General's speech this morning was very clever. You think a verdict for Ronnie would simultaneously cause mutiny in the Royal Navy and jubilation in, in Berlin. Oh, I wish you could be there this afternoon. And have Mother miss out again. You know Mother doesn't understand a word of what's going on. No, but she does enjoy it so, dear. But what about Sir Robert? Well, he finished his cross-examination of the postmistress. Oh, I thought he demolished her completely. He admitted... She couldn't identify Ronnie, oh. but she couldn't be sure of the time he came in and that all Osborne cadets looked alike to her in their uniforms so that it might easily have been another who cast the five shillings. Good, good. Then, when he finished, the attorney general asked her again whether she was absolutely positive that the same boy that bought the 15 and 6 postal order also cast the five shilling one. Oh. And she said yes, she was quite, quite sure because Ronnie was such a good-looking little boy that she'd noticed him especially. Oh. Oh, I could see those twelve good men and two nodding away at each other. I believe it undid the whole of Sir Robert's cross-examination. If she thought Ronnie was especially good-looking, why didn't she identify him two years ago? Mm. Oh, Kate, this is our last chance. Are we going to lose? I don't know. I wonder if you were right. If we could have found a better man than Sir Robert. No. Oh, you admit that now. Only that he's the best advocate in England, and for some reason... Trustees, I suppose, he seems genuinely anxious to win. I don't go back on anything else I've ever said about him. The newspapers say he began this morning by telling the judge he felt ill. Might have to ask for, for an adjournment. It's just another trip, dear. It got him the sympathy, sympathy of the court and possibly provided him with an excuse to, if we should lose. If we should lose. Uh, 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 may I come in? Oh, Desmond, of course. I entered by way of the kitchen. The crowds at the front door are rarely most alarming. Oh, sit down, Desmond. Uh, I uh, wonder if I might see Catherine alone. I have a matter of some urgency to communicate to her. Oh, very well. Uh, I'll finish my lunch, Kate. Oh, allow me, please. Oh, take your hands off this wheelchair. <laughs> Dear me. I can manage without assistance. Thank you, Desmond. Well, Desmond? Uh, I have only a moment, Kate. I really should get back to court, but... It suddenly occurred to me during the lunch adjournment that I had better see you today. Really? Why? I have a question to put to you, which, if I had postponed it till after the verdict, you might, who knows, have thought it prompted by pity if we had lost, or if we had won, your reply might, again, who knows, have been influenced by gratitude. Uh, do you follow me? As a matter of fact, I think I do. Ah, then possibly you have some inkling of what the question is. Yes, and I need hardly tell you... How grateful I am. Oh, there is no need, Kate. Oh, no need at all. However, I know very well what your feelings for me really are. Do you, Desmond? Oh, I've known you so long, dear Kate, and I've proposed to you so many times before. Uh, that is, up until your recent betrothal. Which is now no more. And thus permits me to again, if I may say so, examine the facts. Which are? Fact one, <clears throat> you don't love me and never can. Fact two, I love you, always have, and always will. Uh, that then is the situation. Uh, no matter what you feel or do not feel for me, I want you to be my wife. Thank you, Desmond. Oh, there is so much more that I should like to say, but I shall put it all in a letter. 
Yes, Desmond Green. Now, I must get back to court. Um, how do you think it went this morning? What a brilliant cross-examination was it now? Brilliant. <laughs> oh, he is a strange man, Sir Robert. Oh, at times so cold and distant and... Fish-like. Fish-like, mm. exactly. And yet he has a real passion about this case. Oh, a real passion. I happen to know. Oh, of course, this must on no account go any further. But I happen to know that he has made a very great personal sacrifice in order to bring it to court. Sacrifice? At what? The mother case? Oh, no. That would be no sacrifice to him. Oh, no. He was offered the appointment to Lord Chief Justice. He turned it down simply to carry on with Winslow versus Rex. <laughs> uh, strange are the ways of men, are they not? Uh, goodbye, dear Kate. Goodbye, Desmond. What did Desmond want? To marry me. What again? Oh, sheer lunacy. Oh, I don't know. He's nice and he's doing very well. I told him I'd think it over. By all means. As long as you decide against it. Father, I'm 30 years old. Oh, 30 isn't the end of life. It might be for an unmarried woman with not much look. Rubbish. Better far to live and die an old maid than to marry Desmond Curry. Even an old maid must eat. I, uh... I'm leaving you and your mother everything, you know. There is still little left. Oh, there must be something you can do, something useful. You don't think suffrage work is useful. Well, maybe you're right. But it's the only work I'm fitted for all the same. So the choice is quite simple, Father. Either I marry Desmond and settle down to quite a comfortable and not really useless existence, or I go on for the rest of my life earning two pounds a week in the service of a hopeless cause. Hopeless? Mm -hmm. I never heard you say that before. I never said it before. John's going to be married next month. Is he? Mm, a girl I know slightly. She's a general's daughter. Very suitable. My dear. Oh, I've messed up your life. No. Any messing up between them has been done by me. Oh, I'm so sorry, Kate. Thank you. We both knew what we were doing. Oh, have we just been stubborn? Selfish for refusing to admit defeat. That's what your mother thinks. Father, if you could go back and... Choose again. Would your choice be different? No, I don't think it would. I don't think so either. I still say we both knew what we were doing. And we were right to do it. Uh, but you, you aren't going to marry Desmond, are you? Well, in the golden words of the Prime Minister, Father, wait and see. Here. Yeah. Say, do you hear a news boy? What's he shouting? Let me open a window. Only... Winslow case latest. Oh, didn't sound to me like latest. You're right. Winslow case results. Results? But the verdict wasn't to come in till tomorrow. There must be some mistake. Oh, sir. Sir. Violet, come in here. Well, what's happened? Oh, Miss Kate. Oh, what a shame. You missed it. But it was after they came back from lunch. And Mrs. Winslow, she wasn't here neither, nor Master Ronnie. Huh? The cheering and the shouting and the carrying on. Oh, you've never heard anything like it in all your life. Oh, Violet. And Sir Robert standing there at the table with his wig on, cooking, and the tears running down his face. Oh. Running down his face, they were. And not able to speak because of the noise. Oh. Oh. And then some man behind me, he knocked my hat down over my face. Oh, he was hearing Saul waving his arms and shouting about liberty. <laughs> and the judge kept on shouting, but it wasn't any good because by now the jury was cheering too. <laughs> Jotted it down for you, Mr. Winslow, and now I should read it. 
I say now, on behalf of the Admiralty, that I accept the declaration of Ronald Arthur Winslow and that he is innocent of all charges brought against him two years ago at the Royal Naval College, Osborne. I make this statement without any reservation, intending it to be a complete acceptance of the boy's innocence. It's rather difficult to find the words I, I should say to you. Please don't trouble to search for them. Let us take these rather tiresome expressions of gratitude for granted, shall we? Now, on the question of damages and costs, I fear we shall find the Admiralty rather niggardly. You are likely still to be left considerably out of pocket. However, and doubtless we can apply a slight spur to the First Lord's posterior in the House of Commons. No, oh, please. No more trouble, I, I beg of you. This is all I've ever asked for. It's a pity you were not in court, Miss Winslow. The verdict appeared to cause quite a storm. And so I heard. But why did they surrender so suddenly? Well, it was a foregone conclusion once the handwriting expert had been discredited. I knew then we had a sporting chance, and no jury in the world would convict in the postmistress's evidence. But this morning you seemed so depressed. Did I? Well, the heat in the courtroom was very trying, you know, and I was a little fatigued. Oh, sir, the hmm? gentlemen at the front door say please were to make a statement. They say they won't go away until you do. Oh, uh, very well, Violet, thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, uh, Sir Robert, sir. Uh... What shall I say? I hardly think it matters. Whatever you say will have little bearing on what they'll write. What shall, what shall I say, Kate? You'll think of something, Father. Here, let me wheel you out. No, no, no. no. Just, just hand me my cane. I, I refuse to meet the press in this, this ridiculous chariot. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I could say uh, I'm happy to have lived long enough to have seen justice done to my son. Eh? Isn't that a little gloomy? You're going to live for ages yet. Am I? You'll wait and see. Uh, uh, I could say uh, the victory is not mine, that it's uh, the people who have triumphed. As uh, they always will triumph over despotism. Uh, how does that strike you, Sir Robert? Uh, a little, uh, little bit pretentious, perhaps? I should say it nonetheless. It would be very popular. Huh? <laughs> well, perhaps I'd better say what I really feel, which is really, <laughs> thank God we beat them. Miss Winslow. Might I be rude enough to ask you for a little of your excellent whiskey? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. And with your forgiveness, I shall sit down. Sir Robert, are you feeling all right? Just a slight nervous reaction. I've not been feeling myself all day. I told the judge so this morning, if you remember, but I doubt if he believed me. He thought it was a trick. What suspicious minds people have, have they not? Uh, yes. Your whiskey. Thank you. I'm afraid... I have a confession and an apology to make. My dear young lady, I'm sure the one is rash and the other superfluous. I would far rather hear neither. I'm afraid you must, since this is probably the last time I shall see you. I have entirely misjudged your attitude. I've, I've been rude and ungrateful. I'm sincerely and humbly sorry. Oh, rubbish. My attitude isn't quite the same as yours. The determination to win at all costs. Only when you talk of gratitude... You must remember that these costs were not mine, but yours. Were they not also yours, Sir Robert? I beg your pardon? Haven't you two made a very special sacrifice? The roles of that office are not included, me. Wouldn't they? And what's more, I fully intend to report Mr. Desmond Curry to the Law Society. Oh, please, John. He did me a great service by telling me. Well, I must ask you never to divulge it to another living soul and to forget it yourself. Why are you always at such pains to prevent people from knowing the truth about you? Am I, indeed? You know you are. Why? Why are you so ashamed of your emotions? Because, as a lawyer, I must necessarily distrust you. Why? To fight a case on emotional grounds is the surest way of losing it. Emotions muddy the issue. Cold, clear logic and bucket subjects would be the lawyer's only equipment. Was it cold, clear logic that made you weep today at the verdict? Your maid, I suppose, told you that. No, doesn't matter. It's in the papers tomorrow anyway. Very well, then. If you must have it, here it is. I wept today because right had been done. Not justice? No, not justice. Right. It's not hard to do justice, but very hard to do right. Unfortunately, while the appeal of justice is intellectual, the appeal of right appears for some odd reason to induce tears in court. That is my answer and my excuse. And now, may I leave the witness box? No. One last question. How can you reconcile your 
Support of Winslow against the Crown with your narrow political belief. Very easily. No one party has a monopoly of concern for individual liberty. On that issue, all parties are united. I don't think so. You don't? No. Not all parties. Only some people from all parties. That is a wise remark. We can only hope, then, that those some people will always prove enough people. You know, you'd make a good advocate. Would I? Why don't you channel your feministic impulses toward the law court, Mr. Blow, and abandon the lost cause of woman's suffrage? Because I don't believe it is a lost cause. No? Are you going to continue to pursue it? Certainly. You'll be wasting your time. I don't think so. It's a day. In the House of Commons in days to come, I shall make a point of looking up at the gallery in the, in the hope of catching a glimpse of you in that provocative hat. Whereupon I shall... I say, Sir Robert, I'm most awfully sorry. Master Winslow, are you indeed? I didn't know anything was going to happen this afternoon. And where were you? At the pictures. Well, I'm most awfully sorry, sir. I see we won, didn't we? Yes. Yes, we won. So goodbye, Miss Winslow. Shall I see you in the house then one day? Yes, Sir Robert. One day. But not in the gallery. Across the hall. Among the opposition. Perhaps. Goodbye. For three splendid performances, we'd like to congratulate Ray Milan, Dorothy McGuire, and Brian O'Hearn. It's nice to be working with you again, Irving. It's been a long time since we made a picture together. Mm, Irving's directed me in picture, too. We're old friends. Well, I guess that leaves me out in the cold. <laughs> Dorothy, a Lux girl, is always a friend of mine. Particularly when she's such a talented Lux girl. And Dorothy certainly qualifies. Have you seen her latest picture, Three Coins in the Fountain? She's great, and she looks terrific in Cinemascope. Well, thank you. Lux Soap and I are certainly old friends. Brian, aren't you also in one of 20th Century Fox's Cinemascope productions? Yes, Prince Valiant. Little did I think when I left a brilliant career in England ah, to come ah. to America that I'd wind up in a comic strip. <laughs> well, don't knock it. Last week I was offered the part of Canhead and Big Brain. <laughs> oh, you'll be great, Ray. <laughs> Seriously, I was delighted to appear in such a magnificent production as Prince Valiant. And I imagine Ray is delighted with his latest picture, too, Dial M for Murder. No, oh, I wouldn't dial anything for murder. Wouldn't even pick up the phone. <laughs> Not even if it was directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Ah, well, that's different. Now, Irving... How about next week's show? Is it something different? Yes, it's very unusual. Emotionally adult love story. We've invited two of the top stars of Hollywood to recreate it for you. That exceptionally fine actor, Carrie Grant. Co-starring with one of the loveliest ladies of the screen, Jean Crane. We will present them in their original roles in one of the finest motion pictures 20th Century Fox has brought to the screen. People will talk. I thought it was a wonderful picture. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And thanks for a memorable evening. And now, here's a man with a letter. Yes, it's a letter I got from a woman in New Jersey, and I'd like to read it to you. She says, Dear Art Linkletter, if you'll answer me this, I'll buy a box of surf. You say that when you wash clothes with surf, they smell like sunshine. But whoever said you could smell sunshine? <laughs> Sign, Mrs. Robert Borden. Well, Mrs. Borden, I said it. And I can tell you how to find this out for yourself. You just try the nose test the next time you do your laundry. I mean that when your clothes are still wet or when they're dry, you just hold them right up to your nose real close and give a good sniff. Now, if there's a medicinal odor or a stale, sour smell, that's not sunshine, is it? But when you wash your clothes with surf, you'll find they smell fresh and clean. And that's what I mean by sunshine. Now, these days, all good detergents get things clean-looking. Surf does that, of course. But when it comes to clean laundry, you can't go on looks alone. Because to be really clean, things just have to smell clean, too. And you can depend on surf to get things so clean, they smell like sunshine. And that means they're clean, clear through. So, Mrs. Borden, and all you ladies who haven't tried surf lately... Buy a box of surf and get to know what sunshine smells like. Get the big money-saving economy-sized box of surf and put it to the test. 
Lever Brothers Company, makers of Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Liquid Detergent, invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Harry Grant and Dean Crane in People Will Talk. By the way, those of you with television sets have a big treat in store. On Thursday, January 28th, the Lux Video Theater, our sister show, will present a special one-hour live telecast of Paramount's A Place in the Sun. I'll have more details for you next week. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, a crisis in our schools is growing worse. Three classrooms out of every five are overcrowded. And above all, there's a growing shortage of qualified elementary school teachers. Won't you join and work with your local civic groups and school boards, which are actively seeking to improve educational conditions? Heard in our cast tonight were Martin Dean as Ronnie, Norma Varden as the mother, Helen Cleave as Violet, Mary Flynn as Miss Barnes, Ben Wright as John, Joe Kearns as Desmond, and Alistair Duncan as Dickie. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was composed and directed by Rudy Schrager. <laughs>